<laughs> it's on now. It is on. All right. Um, we have today for our recruiting little seminar, webinar, whatever we want to call it, we've got um, Dan from the University of Utah, Dan Corton. Did I say that right? This is perfect. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, and then we've got Shane Tai from uh, University of San Francisco. So this has kind of been in the works a little bit. Um, we're going to have them here just talking about all things recruiting, recruiting 101, if you will, and then we're going to get this to all of our members from Hive. So uh, we'll start off with just introductions, and so have Dan. If you don't know who Dan is, Dan? Uh, how's it going, guys? Uh, Dan McCorriton. I do work with the University of Utah, but more importantly, I work with the uh, Hive 15s team. Uh, we are awesome. Well, I think it's important to know what just happened with our high 15 We We took third at Crossroads. I assume that's what you're referring to. <laughs> yeah, dog. That's we, right. Uh, but before that, we beat Eric's uh, 17s Ooh. team <laughs> at a local tournament. And I wasn't sure which one he was referring to. I'm doing the editing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we did play, uh, our 17 gold did play our um, 15 gold in a semifinals in the last Power League uh, tournament of the year. And I gotta say, not just my 17s, I was enamored with how the 15s played. And, uh, and it was really awesome to see a group that young just play that, that well. But yeah, we definitely want a spot. We want a rematch. Done. <laughs> we want a rematch. We'll, we'll do it. As soon as you can have more than 10 people in the, in the room, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I've, I've been, uh, I've enjoyed my time here at Hive, but uh, also a recruiting coordinator for the University of Utah. Uh, so got a little bit of knowledge on on what it takes to, to play at the next level, whatever that next level may be. Um, so looking forward to answering some of those questions. Yeah, all right, and then Shane. Me, yeah. Long time, uh, long time friend Shane Ty here. Yeah, go way too far back with Mr. Howard. Uh, and Dan, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, originally from Salt Lake. Um, so knew Eric because he played with my brother in college and, and now I'm at the University of San Francisco. I do indoor and beach out there. I've uh, been out there a couple years, been coaching collegiately for five years or so, and so I went through the recruiting madness myself, and I've been involved with club and coaching collegiately, so I, I know a lot of the ins and outs of recruiting, so I'm excited to give some knowledge, I guess. Yeah, you guys, and thank you guys so much. I know we had to kind of jump through some hoops to be here, and um, I, I just want to say from Hive and from, from our club, thank you guys so much for being here for sure. I think that our kids are going to benefit from, from watching this. Um, so first, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of want to jump into just recruiting 101. So I think um, from a club's perspective, we're always getting all these questions from parents and, and players about how to get recruited and also where the focus should be and, and all that fun stuff. Um, I'll just kind of start. I've always been, hey, get better at volleyball and reach out to people and really kind of control your recruiting and, and, uh, and do the work because you're ultimately the one that's gonna choose what school to go play for and it shouldn't be a coach's decision that one of my athletes are gonna go play for a school because I'm friends with the coach or whatever it might be. And so um, let's just kind of start uh, with just a little, you know, kind of a brief just um, recruiting 101. Like what are you guys looking for in kids? And, yeah. um, you know, possibly, you know, what age do you guys start looking for? We both have um, NCAA D1 coaches here, and so I think that that's going to play a certain role on when you start looking for kids rather than maybe some other schools. Yeah. And uh, so, but we'll just kind of start off with that. Um, I think that we both, there, there's definitely some things that we both want to see and don't want to see um, in terms of correspondence uh, and, and emails. And I think that's right now for, for a lot of you younger, younger players, that's the, the first impression that we're going to get. We can't, for anyone that's younger than a junior in high school, we can't uh, talk directly with you or we can't respond to emails. And so for anyone that's older than that, junior or senior, we can have conversations with you so we can get to know you that way. But sending an email that's going to grab our attention, I think, is, is what's most important. Yeah. I, I get uh, a lot of emails every day, probably upwards of 40 or 50 a day. Yeah. And and a lot of them are uh, are pretty generic, but I want to I just want something to grab my attention, whether that's your vertical, um, how tall you are, uh, maybe some accolades that you have, uh, some 
something, some metric, something that's going to stand out, just to get me hooked, and then I'll then I'll start doing my research from there. Else yeah, no. So the biggest thing with recruiting is exposure, uh, whether it's you're at tournaments where coaches are at, or whether you're actually reaching out and sending out emails. Like if you want to get recruited, you have to be like in our faces. We have to know you exist for you to get recruited. So exposure is going to be your your friend in whatever way that is. If that's just sending out emails to every school that you'd ever imagine playing for, or whether that's playing as many tournaments as you can, or whatever it is. But once you start to do that, then getting into kind of the nitty gritty of, okay, this is what your email should include, um, is gonna be kind of the next step. The only thing I would add to that is, please send like a highlight reel. Um, like Dan said, we get so many, like we get blasted with emails, hundreds a week. Uh, I, I can't sit and watch a half an hour on each kid. Um, so send like a two minute highlight reel, and if, if you're kind of someone we'll, we'll be interested in, then, then we'll kind of either come watch you live or we'll ask you for more footage or whatever, that, that kind of stuff. But the more concise, the better. Uh, we're bombarded with so much stuff that if you send me a three page email with a half an hour clip, I'm gonna read maybe 10 words on that email and maybe watch 30 seconds of that clip. Um, and if it's, like that's all I have time for. Um, and so, being concise, being straight to the point. This is my grad year. This is my position, height, vertical, all that, all the other, like, whatever the activities that you can, that you have, all that stuff. Like, bullet it out, put a highlight thing, and maybe like what club you play for, and like what tournament you'll be at. But we always don't need to do that because if we know your first and last name, we can look you up, <laughs> and we can find out what club you're on, what team you play for, what tournaments you'll be at. When we go to those tournaments. We'll have you marked and say, we want to watch this kid. Um, and so concise is going to be your, your friend because it's going to help us and we'll automatically like you more. <laughs> if you're, you're saving us time. <laughs> and actually brought up a point. Do, you, do either of you know that the university <coughs> athlete costs money for players to use? No. no so, or, okay. Yeah. So you need to update your university athlete profile to have it be um, as comprehensive as possible. That's the first place, like Shane said, yes. when I get an email, I, I log all the emails, or someone does, not necessarily me. <laughs> <laughs> we have people. <laughs> someone does it for me. And, and they, so they go and log it. So we have a list of all the emails that you've sent us. Within there, if there's a contact number that I need for you, um, or for your club coach, or club director, your recruiting coordinator, all of that can be found in, in your university athlete profile. Uh, you can also put a link to your YouTube videos in there. So it's all one, it's free. Um, it's better than, in my opinion, it's better than paying for another recruiting service that can do all this stuff as well. Uh, but we're all, I'm on University Athlete a dozen times a day at least. Easily. Um, and, and, and would you say that every coach out there is on University Athlete? Yeah. I mean, it's the yeah. only platform, yeah. uh, it is the only platform that works as kind of that. That, that, that similar um, platform that is going to be where any coach will go to get information. When we, when we go to tournaments, um, we aren't just texting each other. We're, <laughs> we are on our phones and we have the University app, University Athlete yeah. app pulled up and that shows your court assignment, what time you're playing, who you're playing against, everyone on your team, all the notes that we've left. So we're on that constantly. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, literally the only coaches that I can recall ever seeing that don't have their phones out would be like, you know, Beth. Um, yeah. I've never seen Beth on a phone, or Hugh McCutcheon. <laughs> like, I've never seen him, or Coach Cook. I've never seen, you know what I mean? I've never seen a lot of these, you know. The, yeah. the, 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 that's what the assistants are for. Yeah, that's exactly they, they, they did a sifting. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah exactly. We, we go through all the 800 kids, and then we tell the head coach, okay, these are the three kids that you need to worry about. <laughs> that's my job to do all the grunt work, and then, the, exactly. you know, when you're the boss, you get the perks of, oh, I only have to go watch these couple of kids, yeah. and, and I got assistants that do so, it, so it's, it's good when parents or players are going to see you at whatever event and you have your phone out um, yeah. kind of going through and then you guys are going to get busted for if you are texting each other. Understand that we are not on our phones <laughs> you're like, working. like teenagers are on their phones. Yeah. It is, it is a work-oriented. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, work -oriented for so, sure. so let me ask you this, and this is more of kind of a, a, a general question. So a lot of the times it is when should I start the recruiting process, right? Kind of, it, it scares me and concerns me when 13 and 14 year olds are putting so much focus on recruiting. Um, but then you're also hearing, you know, a very small 
percentage of 13 and 14 year olds getting recruited. But right. from a close perspective, we're always trying to paint that picture is you're not going to get signed 13, 14, 15, 16. Yeah. You know, there's, there's such a small little um, percentage of athletes that had offers that you know, before it was even kind of, you know, not outlawed, but. Um, I mean, it is now. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. All right, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, with, with, with recruiting rules changing last year, I think yep, it was, we yep, can't make yep. offers until August 1st of a kid's junior year. So uh, people that already had offers prior to that, those offers are still valid, and you can accept that any time. But anyone else that hasn't gotten an offer yet, you're not going to get one until August 1st. Or obviously your like, junior year. Your yeah, junior yeah, year. That's, the first, that's the first opportunity a coach can. And, and hopefully that's kind of to alleviate a lot of this pressure on young kids to, right. to, to right. go away and yep. to get recruited and instead they can put all of their focus and energy on actually just getting better at volleyball and learning to love the game a little bit more rather right. than having that day. Yeah. yeah, so I'd say for like the younger kids, the best thing you can do is, is go to the school's camps. Um, yeah. The exposure you'll get just going to the camps and then when you get you know, 15, 16 years old, then that's when you can really start to you know, send the emails and make the highlight reels and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you're younger and you're worried about college and you're 13, 14 years old, enjoy your childhood more than that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, colleges will be there. Uh, if you're good enough, you'll you'll end up somewhere. Yeah. Uh, if you get the exposure, yeah. when you when we need to worry about signing you, then you know. Yeah, we'll, and, we'll and you know the other thing is when kids are recruiting that that young, I mean I think that sometimes the coaches will fluctuate so much, right? Yeah. Um, I've got a job here until job here opens up and then here and then here. And so um, I think such a small percentage is when they're reaching out at a really young age, like they're really doing it for them, yeah. not for not for anybody, yeah. you know, anybody else, kind of that peace of mind if that's what it, it gives them. But yeah, I would I would tell our kids to go to yeah. camps and yeah. to have fun. And, and, and a whole other tangent and I'm gonna go on just because I'm who I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Shane's actually got a camp for us. And I think uh, his first, when he did uh, the camp for us, I think the first thing is, is I'm going to yell at you, don't take the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good warning that I give. Uh, not, there's not a single college coach in the country that cares if you won when you were 12, 13, 14 years old. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you won nationals at 12. If you're not good enough to play me at 18, play for me at 18, I don't care. And so, if you're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, your only focus, your only two focuses. Number one is should be to enjoy the sport of volleyball, and two to get as good as you possibly can, because that's what's going to get you recruited when you're 16, 17, 18. When we can contact you, I'm not going to look at if you won when you when you were 12. I'm going to look at how good you are as a volleyball player at 16. And so, one, enjoy the game and enjoy like the grind of, of practice and getting better. And two, just get as good as you possibly can. That's what's going to get you recruited. Yeah. I don't care what your team accomplished when you were 12 years old. I think if, if I were to go through my notes when I had looked at someone when they were when they were that young, because it happens, my note would be, she's tall. <laughs> yeah. She can jump. Like that's it. Like that's we're it. not we're not about because you have no idea. Like you said, coaches can change, players can change too. <laughs> Within this time, they can start out really, really good. But from the from the boys' side, you play these little Puerto Rican teams, oh my gosh. and they're so good. Like we lose them every year. <laughs> Fourteen year olds, right? Yeah. And then once they once you realize, yeah, we're actually better than them. You're 16, 17 years old, and they don't even come close. Right. So I mean, they can you can be really good young and not develop. Yeah. And that's and I and I think that that's a, another thing to think about when we're talking about these really young kids. And I know that this is recruiting, but you know, from my perspective, I see like stud twelve year olds that are just so good. Yeah. And then by the time they're 14, all of a sudden somebody who's maybe never played football all day in their life, who just happens to be so much more athletic, starts playing and then jumps through, you know, all of these these barriers that, you know, you're supposed to, you know, get the experience when you're young. And so I think that there's so much that can change yeah. at, at Definitely. a young age. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's talk. Let's talk about you know when when you guys are actually going through the recruiting process, and so somebody's maybe emailed you and you're starting to go, okay, hey, maybe I want to see this kid. You've been intrigued by a, a highlight reel or maybe a subject matter. You know, I'm uh, a six-one lefty, my 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 six-teacher, or yeah. whatever it might be. Right. Just throwing out some crazy stuff, which we haven't had one. Uh, <laughs> uh, not joking, but. Um, <laughs> 
So, um, what are things that you're really looking for within these kids? Like, what are some attributes? What are what are some um, I don't know, uh, not just athletic ability, but what are some of the stuff that? Or does that is, is that really relevant? Uh, everything's relevant. Uh, in, in the recruiting, every, absolutely everything yeah. is relevant. Uh, like, yeah, there's little things that'll, that'll initially like, catch our attention, but there's thousands of kids that are going to catch our attention. We have to narrow it down to we have one scholarship for this one position for this one year. Like, what's going to do that is all everything else. Um, and so, whether it's kind of like how high we see your ceiling is and how much potential you you'll have, like you can be really really good at 16, but if I don't see you improving and having a high ceiling by the time you're a senior. College, then it doesn't it doesn't help us. Uh, uh, and then, but personality is a big thing. Uh, parents, gonna just we'll, we can start this tangent right now. Like parents will affect recruiting. You, ninety nine percent of the time, if parents are involved, it doesn't end great. <laughs> uh, because we we're not recruiting you, we're recruiting the athlete, uh, and so we need to know that this kid can come away from the parents and not, and, and still thrive, and, and, and be a, a mature adult. I know that's hard for, to kind of get that as a 16 year old, but two years later, they're gonna be moving away from home and they're gonna be in college. We need to know that if there's an issue, they're mature enough to, to come to us and confront us and do that kind of stuff and not have to wait for mom and dad to do it. Um, that's, a, that's a huge thing. My biggest thing as far as the next step, what I, love to watch, and I tell people all the time, I love to watch potential recruits losing, because uh, you'll see more than what an addict, their personality and who they are in adversity than you will when they're thriving. And so if I can find when their team is down and things aren't going well and I see how she reacts, that's make or break for me. If I see a kid that gets frustrated and starts getting down on our teammates and doesn't handle the pressure well, I don't care how good you are. You're, that, that culture stuff goes further than just talent alone. Uh, and so I love to watch potential student athletes lose or, or be losing or be in a tough situation and see how they react. If they're gritty and they want they want the ball and they stay loud and they stay upbeat and they stay like they're still a good teammate in those moments, that'll go further than anything that you can say in email or anything you can do on a volleyball court as far as me continuing to be interested in you as an athlete. Yeah. I, I, think, I think adding to that is it's not only what you're doing on the court, but when you're when you shank three passes in a row, and then uh, your coach pulls you out, and you're standing along the bench. What is your attitude at that time? Because there you're going to be in, in competition in our gyms all the time. Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to pout on the bench and complain that you got pulled out, uh, then I'm not going to like. I, I will write that note. She got she got yanked and has a really bad attitude. Like I'll put that in my notes, and that'll be. The next thing that we see, the next time we go to watch to watch you play. Uh, so it's not just not just how well you play on the court because people can do that, but like you said, that's adversity. Uh, how can you how can you figure it out through adversity? Um, I like to see how prepared some players are. That sticks out to me too. Am I like, hey mom, I need water? <laughs> like, and then and then mom goes and goes and gets water. <laughs> then. Uh, <laughs> I want to. I want to see that you're prepared uh, coming up to the up to the game. I've I've also seen parents or kids like post match turn and yell at their parents for whatever reason because they they're frustrated they lost the game. And I'm like that just does not look good. Yes. Yeah. So so we're not just looking at what you can do on the court. I think ultimately it's what we're trying to yes. trying to say. There's yes. everything is fair game. Like if you don't think I'm not going to call your academic advisor at your high school, I definitely do. That. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through your social media, um, which is. <laughs> Completely different subject, maybe for a different time. <laughs> I see some things. Yeah, on I, think we, I think we've got our next um, uh, yeah. social media platform. Yeah. yeah, seriously, there's some things on there that I don't ever want to see. Uh, and just because you're private doesn't mean we won't see it. <laughs> yeah, there is ways for us to for us to figure out who you are as a person outside of. Like we we talk to so like, like I mean Danny attested this. Like, for the one kid that we actually sign, I bet I've talked to 20 people. Minimum that know that one kid, and like I want to, I, I have to know that you're going to come in and be the type of player that I need you to be on and off the court. And so we can't just, it's not just how good you are on film or how good you play on the court. There's so many little things that if 
I'm going to invest four years in you and I mean, put our livelihood in your hands, uh, I mean, we're putting our livelihoods in what we see in a 16-year-old girl. Like, we have to be thorough in what we do. And so you, there's a lot of little things that will make or break you. Like, you have to start being mature at a young age if you want to play at, at a high level, but, you know, at any sport. Um, yeah. And I think that that kind of comes with this whole process for these kids. Like, we're trying, we're, as a club, we're trying to prepare them for these moments, right? And everything you guys are saying, I mean, kids and parents can't be thinking that <laughs> club coaches aren't thinking the exact way. Right. What kid yeah. do I want to coach? You know what I mean? And, uh, and I think just to echo what you guys are saying is, you know, your character is going to shine really, really bright when it's tough. And when things are going great, who knows what your real character is, right? Yeah. Because when things are going great, you've got a great team, you've got an amazing coach, your parents are happy, everybody's happy. Yeah. You know, for the majority, everybody's happy. And so it's really hard to see who you're recruiting when things are just always going their way. So I love that you guys are both putting, you know, a, a valid amount of kind of thought on that process in terms of in how you guys are recruiting. And at the end of the day, the other thing kids need to understand is you guys are kind of putting a lot on the line yeah. by getting them to be in your gym. And I think that that's just a window that they need to get. That's just an invitation that they need to take from you guys is allow me to show you who I am. Right. You know what I mean? And then go blow their freaking socks off. Right. Show them what amazing kid you are. I think just to, just to add on like one thing that Shane said that kind of struck a chord with me is we, we talk to a lot of people uh, but we talk as well. <laughs> so any information that, coach to coach. That, yes. that, that Shane finds out about you, if we're standing watching the same kid, he'll be like I, I heard this about this kid like you're not, you're not going to want it. I'm like okay. Then I'll put in my notes, Shane from USF told me this, this, and this. So we, we talk. So if you treat him poorly um uh, or if something happens and he hears from your academic advisor that this and this happened, it's gonna get to me at, at yeah. some point. And that can also work for, for the better. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So maybe well, you sure. love this kid, but you just don't have a scholarship spot for yep. him, but you yep. know that she's a, a scholarship kid. Yep. Yep. And you might vouch for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, that, that was, I mean, that's all the things that we're saying like in a negative connotation that can be taken the other way. Like if you are the type of kid that when you get pulled, you have a good positive, like you're positive. Like if I see that, but I don't have a, a necessarily something in like your position or, or something in your year, I'll, I'll spread, I'll spread the word. Like I got a text, uh, what was it the last time I was at Vegas? I got a text from a club coach that says, Hey, come watch this kid. She's kind of flown under the radar. I went and watched her and I'm like, I loved her. And I just didn't have a scholarship for her, and I knew she needed a scholarship. And I text like six different coaches, just like, hey, go watch this kid. Like, this kid deserves a scholarship at a Division I school. Her club coach has said all these great things about her. I just, I don't have money for her. And so, like, we, we talk, and like, the, cup, the, the volleyball world is very small. Uh, the coaching world is very small, and, and, and we, we communicate, and things can work to your advantage uh, just as much as they can work to your disadvantage. You know, if, if it doesn't work out at one school, if you handle things the right way with that one school, it will open doors at other schools. Because we we talk yeah. uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think it's important for people to understand like everything they say is, is going to impact yeah. possibly how that is, and I think that's really scary because some kids um, going through the recruiting process. I went through the recruiting process at the age of 19, and um, Adam Longmore? Longmore, yeah. You guys remember Adam yeah, Longmore? Adam. Um, I think he's back in Utah. He wanted me to fly out to um, uh, Columbus, Ohio, to go to William Woods, right? And yeah, yeah. I remember being 19, year old, 19 years old going, I'm not going to do this. And so we're asking, and that's the hard part from a club's perspective. We're acting 16, we're asking 16, 17, 18 year olds to yeah. do this thing that is pretty scary for them. So I think it, it, it's a lot to take in. So I think direction from the club is going to be really, really important. And then just kind of hearing some college coaches are going to be good as well. Yeah. Um, before we move on, do you guys have any, any, do you have any, any last, you know, recruiting 101? Um, the other thing is like recruiting 101 is, is one, life is bigger than volleyball. And, and you're hearing that from someone who's insanely obsessed with the sport of volleyball. Uh, like finding, finding, that's an understatement, right? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I know you're well. Since, uh, since six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my whole life. It's a board curse. Uh, 
so finding a school is not just about like going to the best volleyball school. Like finding what's right for you and the, the fit that's right for you in the recruiting world is, has nothing to do with I want to go play at the best school possible. Like if, you, if that's your only goal, you're going to miss the mark. And, and 10 years down the road when you're 25 and your career's over, you're going to go, did I really kind of get the most out of this? Um, you know, we, we both played at BYU, and, and so our, our, the door that opened for us is, I mean, it's a great school, and it was, it was all these like, amazing things that happened, and, and we got to go play with some of the best players in, in, in the world, and so it, it correlated. Uh, so we were, we were fortunate. You know, I, I consider myself very fortunate for the, the things that I was able to experience, but there's so many kids that go to schools, and they're just so unhappy. Um, and that's whether it's the wrong school or whether it's the wrong level. Like Division One athletics is such a grind, and it's such a like job that if you're not completely obsessed with volleyball, you just enjoy it kind of. Go somewhere smaller. Like go and go go to a junior college where you can just go and enjoy being a, a, a good volleyball player, and you don't have to worry about you know the pressure and all that kind of stuff. Like I played a year in Salt Lake Community College, and. It reminded me... And that's after BYU. You were at well, BYU. So I did a freshman year at BYU, mission, and then went to Slick before yeah. transfer to BYU. So it's kind of in the middle. I yeah. just, my story's horrible. Uh, I like it. But, but, <laughs> but that, that year at the community college reminded me of my love for the game. Uh, because there's so much politics in Division One. Yes, it's the best volleyball. Yes, you can play the highest level of Division One. But if you're not obsessed with this sport, and you don't want to just eat and sleep and breathe the sport of volleyball, you're going to get burnt out. Like we had, I don't know how many teammates that were top 50 recruits in the country that would come to BYU and not finish their career because they weren't obsessed with it. And they could have gone somewhere else. Like I have a teammate that I try and get to play in tournaments all the time. He quit after his sophomore year. He was a top 10 recruit in the country, and he, just, he won't come play pickup ball with me. Like he just doesn't like the sport anymore. He just like lost his passion for it. And so if, if your obsession's not there, then go somewhere where it's not going to beat it out of you, where you can still have the love of the game. If it is, and you want to play at the highest level possible, then go play at the highest level possible. But if it's not, don't waste your time, don't waste our time, don't waste every other coach's time. Like, go find somewhere that's best fit for you, and then find somewhere that's got the degree that you want. Like, you have to have a career and a life after volleyball is over. Like, your body will fall apart at some point. You'll, your career will end at some point. Find something that you can back up, like, that once it's over, you can go and, and do something with your life afterwards when, when, when the knees have given out, yeah. you know? Uh, or you can just be like us and be suckers for volleyball for the rest of your life and make a career out of it. And just deal but, with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but either way, like, find something and, like, find, see the bigger picture in, in what the, like, volleyball can create so many opportunities for you if you focus on the bigger picture. If you're so channeled on one thing, you're going to miss the one. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, uh, there's a place for everyone. Yeah. Maybe not Division One, but I mean, kind of just doing the math. Uh, there's 320, 330, some odd Division One teams. Most of those schools, we'll say 300 of them, uh, are fully funded. So that's 12 scholarships per team. So you're looking at 3,600, 3,600 scholarships yeah. um, through Division One volleyball. So there's a place for you. Um, so be realistic with yourself as well. Definitely stretch yourself and. Go look for places that you want to go to. And I think to add on, my second point is I tell recruits all the time to make a list of the top five things that you have to have at a school. And if a school that you're looking at doesn't have those five things, stop looking at them. Uh, I mean, just, and then, and then I would say maybe have another list of five things that you would really, really like because you've narrowed your, your search down. These 10 schools have it, but these five schools have these other five things that I like as well. I think that'll make your search so much easier instead of. Of trying to be frantic and searching just for any place to go play ball. Yes. Like you said, you'll miss the mark. Yeah. And, I th and I think it's important putting that on kids, right? Because I think that there is an evolution of getting prepared to treat volleyball like it's my job. And I don't oh, personally yeah. think that that's for anybody that's in high school just yet. Even if they're not working and they're just playing a sport, which that's what I hope my kid will do. But <laughs> still, I want, I want there to be balance. And then the other thing is, is that when you're truly committing program and you know the school um, I love when coaches when college coaches talk to kids about what you want to be you know what I mean and because it's gonna be rough if you haven't if you're if you're playing volleyball and you've gone through your club season uh, your club career and you've never 
faced a bad thing, then consider yourself one of the smallest little percentages ever, and you're just that much better than everybody. But the reality is that it's going to happen, right? Even if you're the stud in your in your pool, you're going to get to a, a program that's going to have eight more of you, if not more, if not everybody. And so I think that it's really, really important for kids to really commit to the program. One, I want to play, and this is where I want to go to school. And then when it is tough, you get yelled at by a coach. That's going to happen, right? Yeah. You receive some hard coaching, or maybe you're not getting the playing time that you want, or, or, or whatever it might be. That's where I think it's really important for kids to make the decision that this is what I chose, and I'm going to work hard at, it, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get to where I want to be because I'm going to work through it. And I think that every coach, whether you're a club coach, a college coach, I think that everybody can agree that, that, that that's kids that they want to coach. Um, Dan said something that talked about when he was breaking down um, scholarships and how many schools are out there. And I don't have all those stats. And <laughs> I don't. And it would be hard to even update those. But um, what do you do with your scholarships? You said 12 scholarships per Division one program, right? So what are you, like, I think a kid's going to hear that and go, oh my gosh, 12 scholarships, that's a lot. Well, not really. <laughs> how, many, how many do you have on your team? Total. Scholarship, non-scholarship. How many kids? 15, 16. 15, 16. That's, that's for, for indoor. Indoor. For you, right? For indoor. Yeah. 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 And uh, this year, I think we, we might have like 19 yeah. uh, or something awesome. like that. It's a really, that's a big roster. That's a big roster. Yeah. Uh, and and kids get maybe, scared in the club of 10. Yeah. yeah. And so it's yeah. 11. It gets, I don't know why I just did this. Like, <laughs> don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> but, but, but kids get scared of a big roster, right? right? And so I think that it's really important for them to understand, like, when you say scholarships that you're awarding out, it's, you don't get 12 per year. Right. You get, you know, and so maybe break that down a little bit um, on how scholarships work and how they kind of change. Because another thing that I wanted to touch base on before we start trying to wrap it up is for 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, especially 18-year-olds that are not, maybe they're scholarship kids at some level. You know, whether it's junior right. college, maybe it's D1, maybe it's not, but they're maybe a scholarship kid at some level. I think that they're going to start feeling like I missed opportunities and and start really kind of showing signs of, oh my gosh, whether I don't have money to, to go to school. Um, I've got a really awesome kid that played at Judge, and this is a real quick story, but uh, she called me the first year we opened high and said, hey, I need to learn how to set. This is a middle blocker at Judge, right? And she goes, I need to learn how to set. She had decent hands. And I said, I go, whoa, why? She goes, everybody left. And my coach says, I'm, I'm the next best setter, so I got to learn how to set. And I said, if everybody's leaving, I said, why aren't you leaving? She goes, are you kidding me? They're paying for my school. Like, I'll do, I'll clean toilets if they want, you know? And, and yeah. this is the kid that's going into, I think, you know, somewhere in Nebraska, a little tiny junior college, but she's getting her school paid for. So, um, so yeah, I think that there's going to be a lot of kids that are going to feel like they missed opportunities, and sometimes the reality is that maybe you play for a program is not the way that, I mean, maybe it is a walk-on if your grades are good. Maybe it's other money, you know, um, instead of an athletic scholarship. And so, if we can, can we talk about that just briefly? I know that Shane's um, dealing with an um, out-of-state tuition for Utah kids, but you are recruiting everywhere, you've got some kids from... Italy. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we have kids from all over the world. We have like, you know, seven different countries or something like that right now. Like it's just crazy. Like, we recruit from all over. Uh, Perks of being in San Francisco, as people know where we are. Uh, yeah. But like, yeah, we have we have kids from all over, and so. Uh, but with the scholarship thing, like we usually have, you know, if we if it all worked out perfectly, we would have three scholarships per year. You know, because there's four years, there's twelve scholarships. It doesn't always work out like that. And usually we know exactly what position we need for what year. Like I know exactly what I need in 20, what I need in 21, what I need in 22, what I need in 23 when I go out looking. And so I don't need a setter this year. I'm not looking at setters that year. And, and so that's another, like, I don't know, harsh reality you have to come to. You want to play for this specific school. You're good enough for a scholarship. They might not have money for you. That's, that's nothing else other than that. Like they just don't have money to give for your position for that year. Um, and so that, that goes into a, a big big part of it, is what the team needs and when we have money available. You know, we talk to kids all the time, like we were talking to a kid the other day that was, she was really good, we needed her for, we needed her to be a year younger. And so we told her, like, look, we don't have a scholarship this year, but if you want to come and do like a 1-3, we 
we can give you money, you know, the next year. And there's a lot of schools that will try and do that. And so if that's something you're open to, then that's going to open some possibilities. Um, walk on is going to open on up a ton of possibilities. If you can walk on somewhere and you're, you know, really good academically and you can get all this money, this academic money, I'll take so many kids that, you know, one, I know they're not going to be an issue in the classroom. And two... With grades. Yeah, 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 yeah with yeah. grades and, and, and staying up to date on that kind of stuff. And, and, and two, like, they, you, you come in and, and, you know, it's, it's I, don't, I don't know how to put it, you're, you're a free kid for us. And so, like, we're more open to, yeah. to bringing those kind of kids in, you know, because we don't have the money available. And so there's a lot of ways for you to open up options for you um, to take care of school. Uh, it's important. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then be realistic and understand that it might not be your skill set that doesn't that limits you from going to certain schools. It might just be the situation that the program's in, or, Time. or yeah, timing. Time. Is, Time. Timing is everything. Uh, and so, don't take it harshly that it's that it didn't work out, and, and be open to going somewhere else. I mean, there's yeah. thousands of schools out there with thousands of great coaches, with great opportunities, with good schooling, and all the things that you you know you're hoping to find. And it might be somewhere that you would never fathom going before, you know, and and, and it, it might open doors that you would never imagine open. And, and so be open to that and understand that there's so much, so many little things at work that are going to affect your one potential spot. Um, but there is 300 and some odd schools that can maybe they're in a different, better situation. Yeah, and I think to. Um... <clears throat> The, the whole goal, at least being a parent, I'm kind of thinking about this for my own daughter. The, the goal would be for her to be able to go through college debt free. Yeah, right. Um, if that's an athletic scholarship, great. If that's going to school where I coach, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but academics is huge. I want to emphasize that. Like yeah. you can, if you can, volleyball is just a means to getting your education ultimately. Because most of most of us, I didn't. I'm not going to go play professionally. That ship has sailed. Um, <laughs> but, but, to go from us, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but if you can get an academic scholarship and still participate with the volleyball team, you're still getting your school paid for. Yep. So yeah. we only have 12. Uh, any, any given year, we can only have, uh, we've got 19 players this year. Uh, there'll be 12 kids on scholarship, seven that aren't on scholarship. Uh, some of those are on academic scholarships. And then that's fine. Because they're, they're still going to be finishing their career debt free. Yeah. And ultimately, if that's what you can do, then there's, then for the parents that are watching, that's the return on your investment. Right. Like, that's what it's all about. You're putting all this money in the club, um, and if you can get a return on that investment with your child going through school debt-free, paying an arm and a leg at USF, um, yeah. or in-state tuition made at Utah, but still, it's money. Yeah. Um, and if you can go through school debt-free, that's, that's what it's about. So it's okay. And that, that being said, once you get into a program, you're not going to be treated any different because you're a scholarship yeah. or a walk-on yeah. kid. Like, if you're a walk-on kid and you come in and you beat out every other scholarship kid, you're going to be on the court. Like, I'm not I'm not going to lose a game because I need to have my scholarship kids on the court. I don't give a crap who you are. Like, <laughs> you, could be, you could be the only walk-on on the court. If you're the best player, yeah, scholarship playing. or not, you're on the court. You know, it has nothing to do with, like, once you're in, whether you're on scholarship or not, like, our girls don't have any idea who's on scholarship yeah. and who's not. Yeah, they, don't, they don't have a clue. Like, and my first year of every college that I've been at, I didn't even know like, until like, I actually like, asked the coaches. Like, I didn't care. I walked into practice, and I'll treat everyone equally. It doesn't matter. And it, that doesn't matter at all of how I'm going to treat you in the gym. The only thing I care, once you're in my program, the only thing I care about is your work ethic and what you're doing to get better at volleyball, what you can do for our program on the court. Whether I'm funding you or the academics is funding you doesn't change that. Like It will never change that. And if there's any like college coach that disagrees with that, then they're, they're missing the mark. <laughs> and they might, they not be, yeah. might not be coaching. Yeah, they're not going to coach very long. long. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think performance is important. Right. right. Performance yeah. is important. Um, so, uh, last tip. Um, let's talk transfers, good and bad, right? right. And so, uh, tra right now, I think a lot of, there's a lot of people transferring. Right? Yes. And um, one thing that I want to really get out to kids is, you know, if, if your dream is D1, just kind of like we, we talk, touched base a little bit earlier, is that I think every path is different, right? It might be a walk-on, or it might be, hey, we don't have a spot, um, go play at a junior college for a little bit, um, and then 
and then we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, right? Um, uh, I can never say her name. Lalna. Yeah. <laughs> Is that who you're going to talk no, about? Um, she, no. No. Oh. Middle blocker. Auntie. Uh, two years ago. Graduated two years ago. Um, oh, uh, Tani. Yes. I can never say her name. <laughs> she was one of my favorite kids, uh, kids to watch, right? She was just, uh, she, she was a machine, and she came and played two years for you, right? Yeah. Um, from a, from CSN. From a, yeah, from a Duke. And so I think I think a lot of the times you'll you'll get these kids, whether it's our, our kids, our, our schools from Utah, or wherever, you guys are taking transfers from kids that have maybe played call it pay their dues or opportunities yeah, or however sure. it is, that they've earned their way to that D1 platform. And uh, and tell me what you guys think about those kids. We had we had four kids on our roster this year that played at junior colleges before they came to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether that was they flew under the radar and didn't get recruited or whether they just went to a junior college and busted their butt and got good enough to play D1. Yeah. Whatever it was, it doesn't matter. They're where they are now. Yeah. Um, but I'll never, like, I will always like cherish the year that I played at a junior college. Um, part of that is because I played for my dad, he was the coach, so like that's a little, I'm a little biased there. Um, I played but, for Coach Ty. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my little brother was my center, my older brother was my assistant coach. So, I mean, it was, there's other reasons why I enjoyed it, but, but I'll, ne like, I'll never regret the year I played at a junior college before I went back to BYU. Um, uh, and, and there were so many little things that it reminded me of and, and got me where I was to be able to go and actually make the roster at the time the number one program in the country, you know, and that was, and, and I was a walk-on, you know, so I'm not ashamed of it, <laughs> you know, like I've, <laughs> well, yeah, I've well, not always, but, you know, but, you know, and, and that's, and, and so my path was, was crazy. I went to BYU my freshman year and I got cut and I dropped out of school completely and I just went back to work and was never planning on playing collegiate volleyball again. Then I did two years in Louisiana and got fat, and then I came back and I had to play at a junior college, and then I transferred back to BYU, you know? So I was 22 years old before I really played my first, like before I was officially on a full year roster at BYU. You know, I never would have guessed that was my path. I never would have guessed that's what, that, that's what, that's what have, have, where my college career would have taken me. And, and now I'm, you know, carried through this and here I am coaching at the Division One school and, and, and loving what I do every day. My path was so out of the norm, but I wouldn't change it for anything. And so like understand that your path might not be, oh I'm gonna be a full ride kid and I'm gonna go play my four years and I'm gonna go play professional. If it is great, but that's such a small percentage of the population. Like you might be a kid that's just you gotta go buy your time at a junior college. You might go buy your time somewhere else. And Unfortunately, with the whole, like, fortunately, fortunately, however you look at it, for you guys, the whole transfer portal thing, like, opens up so many options for you, um, because you can, you know, you can make these changes, you can find the right fit for you, as much as it sucks for us sometimes, um, but it's also a two-edged sword, because we get transfer kids to come to us to help us, you know, from, from other programs, and so there's, there's so many pathways that you could end up taking don't don't get down on yourself if it doesn't go according to your plan. Because my plan was, there was a wrench thrown in my plan like 20 times before I was actually a collegiate, like D1 athlete. Um, and, and then there was more wrenches thrown in there, you know, with injuries and all that kind of stuff. And so my, my career never amounted to anything that I ever thought it was going to or wanted it to, but I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah, I, I love seeing kids that have gone through other programs, um, junior colleges or, or whatever, yeah. and have kind of gotten their way up to that D1 platform. We, we, we look at we look at junior colleges <coughs> every year. Constant. Yes. yes. There's not a there's, if a kid comes through, they've got experience, and that they can help you for two years. And would you, Would you say that those are more convenience kids, or would you guys say that you know, hey, right now we're looking for something our program needs, and maybe it's this kid has a little bit of experience already playing, and and there's some. I mean, there's some junior colleges that are legit. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're yeah. legit. Well, there's kids that go to junior colleges because they had horrible grades. Yeah. They're good enough to play Division One, but they just don't have the grades. So they go do their two years in junior college. They get their A, and they can get into uh, they can get into Division One school. Mm -hmm. That happens. 
Uh, and then there's kids, like Shane said, that aren't good enough to play Division One, and they bust their tails for two years, and they get there. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter to me how you get there. But uh, as long as you're good enough for our gym, then we're going to make the program better. We want. Yeah. Yep. We don't care what the story is, just where you're now. Right? Yep. Yeah. Will you be accepted to a bar school? <laughs> yeah. Can you get in? Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So hey, you know we're gonna we're gonna go to some questions, and so what we're gonna do here, these are gonna be questions from people that have emailed our info um, email address. We're not gonna say who they came from, um, and we're just gonna kind of keep it random, and, and we're just gonna kind of bounce them off of each other. Uh, let's try to keep a twenty second answer time. Rapid fire. Yeah, just rapid fire. So first question that I think is a pretty good question, um, and let's start with this towards Dan. Okay. Um, so I want to know if there's other ways to get coaches uh, to get on coaches' radars besides emailing. I've been emailing uh, a lot of schools, and they cannot respond to uh, the NCAA rules. But sometimes I feel like emails are not being received. So, is there another way to get on a radar? Yeah, uh, come to camp. Yeah, I like it. That's, that's that's the easiest way to get on someone's radar is come to camp. Yeah. Come to camp. Or maybe maybe to add, if you can pass a ball. You'll be on my radar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you good at volleyball? Yeah. 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 But yeah. Uh, part of that is just, I mean, someone's got to be harsh here, but you got to be realistic. Like you're, you're emailing all these, you know, top twenty schools in the country. And you're not a top twenty player. You're not going to get a response. Like I'm sorry. That's just, that's the fact of the matter. That's the reality of life. And so, you might be emailing fifty coaches, but they you might not be that caliber. And and if if you are. I mean, nine times out of ten, we'll, if we'll kind of assess that. Um, and if you're not, then, then maybe you need to broaden your horizons a little bit and and, and not lose confidence, but reality check. I don't, I don't so what, so what you're telling me, <laughs> let's pretend I'm a 6'1 male in high school and I only jump 34 inches. Yep. BYU's not going to look at me as a guy. No. Yeah. 34 is not big enough. I wish somebody, uh, it wasn't me. <laughs> uh, I wish somebody would have told the younger me, like, yeah. hey, you gotta jump higher. Yeah. And maybe I would have gone, okay, hey, awesome. I'll, yeah. I'll work on that. But re be, a, be realistic. Yeah, and that's, and that's, and yeah, program that's, that yeah you, you might be reaching out to a lot of schools, or you think you're reaching out to a lot of schools, but we get hundreds of emails. Like, I can't, like, stress this enough. Like, we get hundreds of emails, and we only, like, we're only looking for certain kids, certain positions, certain years. So, if I can't, I can't respond to 300 emails. Every single week. So if, if you're if you're not a, like a even a maybe kid, then you're kind of pushed back, and that's I mean, that's lost in the shuffle. Yeah, the that's that's a harsh reality that you have to just kind of be okay with. And so reach out somewhere else, like try and get exposure somewhere else, and at least start the recruiting trail yeah. somewhere else. Um, yeah. Because we're recruiting kids from all over the world. They're recruiting kids from all over the world. We're looking for two scholarships this year from. Thousands of athletes, like you might not be one of those two. I'm sorry, go somewhere else. <laughs> like, look, look somewhere else. I was trying to keep this answer to less than this. <laughs> <laughs> he just ran away with it. Hey, so, you know, Dan, you're, so you know, of, you know Dan, you're in the middle of something that's not good. Uh, <laughs> two guys that don't know how to shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, rapid fire question okay. right now uh, for both of you guys. Uh, simple answer um, What are your physical requirements? Depends on position. For sure. So uh, let's say um, let's say a six rotation player. But speaking it, generally, because we can't talk about right, specifics. Right. Generally, generally, speaking, speaking, generally division yes. one, a very there you go. A very yes. basic like yes. You want to be an attacker in division one, you gotta be somewhere around ten feet. Ten feet. And if you're not, you've 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 gotta be really, really crafty. Um, you're gonna be playing against kids that are touching ten and a half feet, ten eight, and, and you know, at the division one level, you've got multiple kids that are touching over ten and a half feet, so if you're at nine and a half feet, you're at a giant disadvantage. Right. So yeah, that's that's a pretty general division one baseline. So what I'm gonna say right now to everybody is everybody might have access to a basketball hoop, whether it's uh, on the street, whether it's in a gym, wherever it might be, or a target. Try daily, try to touch that rim. Yep. <laughs> daily, try to touch that rim. Um, we go up against uh, some of the tallest players, some of the best players in the country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if if you look at the target where you, where you want to play, look through the rosters on uh, on those teams. Yeah. 
<laughs> it gets a reality check. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that most schools that play against Stanford um, on a regular basis, so generally speaking, <laughs> uh, they're not they're not going to take a, a five ten outside that touches nine eight. Right. Because on the other side of the net, you've got a six five right side that's contact that ball at ten eight. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so we just we need to get high. Yeah. We need it. All right. Another quick. What do you look for in setters? So, do we have <laughs> another hour? Uh, setters, I, I think, are so crucial. I think uh, that's, that may be a tricky question. Yeah, no, really I, I, I actually question. think the easiest way to put it is: Do you put up a hittable ball? Because consistency. Consistency is number one. Because that's that's it. Yep. If, if you can put up a hittable ball, uh, everything else, the technique that that you are taught in the Midwest, probably more in Utah, but I've got a Midwest setter right now, her technique is different. Yep. Um, I can change that, but can you consistently put up a ball? It's not about me as the setter, sorry. It's not about the setters, and you're never gonna get the board, and that's just what it is. No, you're not. But, yeah. but you put up a hit of a ball, and your outsides will make you look really, really good. Yep. Uh, tempo, tempo is the one thing that I think, um, if you can keep your hitters in rhythm, Yep. That's putting up a hittable ball every time, keep them in rhythm, and then you'll be just fine. Yeah, you can, consistency is the biggest thing we look for. Uh, second thing we look for is foot speed. Yeah. Uh, you got to be quick. If you want to be a setter at Division I, at any level, uh, passers aren't as consistent as we want them to be. You're going to be running and chasing stuff down. you got to be quick. Uh, foot speed is going to be huge. So if you're putting up a consistent ball and you've got a good foot speed, yeah. you'll be on our radar. All right, that's kind of a trick question because that's such a – yeah, we can do a whole we can do a whole talk on just Saturdays. <laughs> All right, so um, how many players do you guys take a year? Depends on depends on the year. Depends on the year. Depends on what you need. Um, we lost this last year three players, um, and we're bringing in four this year. Mm -hmm. So it has yeah. nothing to do with how many we lost. It's what we think we're going to need during during this year. Just keeping so, the team competitive. Oh yeah. Yep. Sure. Um, and keeping options. Yep. There's probably not a year where we don't take any. Uh, there's right. probably not a year where we take five. That's probably a lot. Yeah, the five's a lot. We brought in five a couple years ago. That's yeah. tough. That's that, that stuff. So uh, one, one to four. Three. Yeah, four is one to, one to four. Uh, another question we have is what do you get? Uh, what's the best way to get noticed by coach? I feel like we've covered that quite a bit. So hopefully we've answered that question. For get good. Ask. That's a yeah. nice way. Good at volleyball. <laughs> um, uh, Let's go, what makes a player stand out um, the most with their attitude? Yeah, you, you yeah. touched on this. So, I mean, ob obviously, athletics. I mean, athleticism, yeah. that's easy stand out, yep. right? You're either yep. tall, you can jump higher, you can hit hard, or something of that nature. They'll blow people up, you're going to get noticed. Yeah. But what are you guys looking at attitude-wise? Yeah, I, I think Shane hit the nail on the head. When, when you're in a tough situation, how do you, are you the one bringing everyone down, or are you lifting everyone up? Yep. I, I just want to, I want those players that are going like to lift up their team. If you want to play Division One volleyball, you're going to be in a lot of tough situations, and you're going to be playing some really tough teams. Whether yeah. you're trying to play Stanford, or for us, as we would play BYU, you know, like that's it's we're playing against some, some teams that just are monsters. Uh, and you're going to be in tough situations. How you respond in, in a two adversity is the number one thing we're looking for. Love it. Okay, so we kind of ran this question in a little bit. Shane, you like this? I'm going to give it to you. Okay, um, what kind of emails should I be sending out right now? Yeah, we, you know, we, touched, we touched base on this a little bit, but the, the concise is, is what's going to help us. Yep. Um, highlight video. Who you are. Yeah. The name, grad year, position, like height, vertical, a little bit about you, like, like, like Dan was talking about, like something to kind of make you stand out. Um, but if you're more than a paragraph, like, yeah, we've got time for that. Yeah, you're killing us. <laughs> All right, Dan, uh, a little bit of a local question. So this is going to be targeted towards you. So uh, local as in just the, the club scene. Yeah. Um, since tournaments have been postponed and canceled, uh, what will coaches be using to evaluate? So it's a, it's a good question. I think Dan will have – I mean, he can come to our – our tournaments are going to happen, guys. I don't know when I'm going to post this video, but we're going to have a season. <laughs> we're going to have a dead set on Somewhere. Yes. Somehow. Whether it, it – we're – this is going to happen. But – how are you? How are you gonna? How, how are people gonna get you to look at them? Um, film from past tournaments. Uh, that's that's the be the best thing. Although it doesn't show your progress, at least it gives us something. You're dangling a carrot in front of our face. Oh, this this kid was good six months ago. 
Are they still working? Are they going to get better? Yeah. Um, but it, these are unprecedented times, and so we're as coaches, we're still trying to figure this out. We, <laughs> we don't know. I for everyone that hasn't seen the, the recruiting dead period was just extended yesterday to May thirty first. So that's not not necessarily anything out of the norm because May is normally a dead period, but this could continue going. So yeah. our the thing that we're talking about um, as coaches, I think when I talk to friends, is how are how are your players continuing to get better right now? How are they getting the touches on the ball? What six touch pepper are they doing? Are they passing balls off the wall? Whatever it is, yeah. somehow during this time, continue to work on your skills. Have a ball, carry it around with you, just pass it a thousand times to yourself, get the feeling of what it feels like to get a ball square on your platform. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, just little things like that. Like, send us a video of that, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, that'll catch my attention. If this, oh, kid, if this kid's working hard when no one's watching. And yeah, then, so right now, that's what I would say. There's like eight million TikTok challenges going around with volleyball yeah. stuff, so I'd hop on those and, and work on your skill set. Yeah, yeah, whatever you can do right now. Volleyball challenges galore. Crazy time. Um, what camps should I choose uh, to go during the summer? I know both of you guys are just gonna easy, mine. <laughs> uh, but this is such a valuable time for kids to get recruited, especially into their junior year. Right. Um, and from a club perspective, it's hard because college, it's not like colleges have a, a camp period from you know uh, May to August when yeah. your season start. Right. And it's not like you guys are going to go, hey, when are you doing yours? And I'll do yep. mine different. So yeah. this is a really, really, really. Well, the thing about camps is like they're expensive. It's like very. Ninety percent of most you know athletes that you just can't afford to just go to 20 camps a summer like you know, I, I never could that was never my situation and so it's the kind of stuff we've kind of reiterated already a bunch is, is do some research on the schools that you think are going to fit best for you whether it's skill wise whether it's major wise whether it's team or coaches or whatever it is you've got to do some research before you start throwing hundreds of dollars towards these camp and making it like that what camp you should do is going to be 100% dependent that's that's a solo thing like it's each individual should go to a different camp. Um, it should go to a different school. It should do a different thing. So you've got to do some some soul searching and some research and yeah. find what what the best fit for you is. And then that's where you should invest your time and your money. I, I th I'm going to get in trouble here. And Shane, you know you're you're my number one homie ever. <laughs> but I think that from a close perspective, I would say there's a few things to look at. One is financially, like yep. what can you afford, and two is convenience, like what's yep. going to fit into your schedule. So a lot of times I'll hear kids going to camps, you know, across the country, you know, going to the number one school in the, the nation. Well, unless you can find it, maybe do something different, right? right? Because I know, hey, I could get noticed going to Stanford's camp, but unless I'm a, unless I'm a Stanford kid, right? I, you know, it's not going to happen. So I think a lot of the times it's convenience, and uh, and don't stretch yourself too thin. I, I, that's what I got to say to yeah. our, our athletes, and so. I've seen people go to camps that are like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. They've been to like four different camps in two yeah. weeks, and they're like two or three days long. And by the time you get to your last camp, that may be your best shot. Yeah, at, I get, understand. At getting a scholarship <laughs> or getting on a team even. It's a yeah. Long sport. And that being said, like, there's a lot of really good, like, junior colleges and D2 and D3 colleges that put on great camps. Like, don't feel like you have to go to a Division One camp because it's a Division One. There's, you're going to get great exposure. You're going to get great coaching at, at camps, thousands of camps, not just the top 20 schools in the country. Yeah. And um, there might be some local clubs that are running stuff, too. <laughs> maybe, there, there might, might be. be. There <laughs> might be. <laughs> no, With some pretty good Man, coaches. I, I'm talking, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, we got two more questions, and okay. then that's it, guys. And, uh, and then this conversation will still be Yeah. yeah. Just, and then just, we'll just, that off. Yeah. We'll keep, we'll keep so, uh, let's target this to, to Shane. So, last one, I think Dan got. Um, how closely do coaches look at ACT scores um, if they have a lower AT, uh, ACT score but a higher GPA? How does that how does that affect them to your recruiting? That's all dependent on institution. Uh, some institutions can get away with not doing as well. And, and, like, private schools, you usually have to have a higher ACT and a higher GPA. Like, uh, so, it just, it just depends on the institution. And so... That's, that's something that, once again, like you're doing some research, you can look in, like, okay, what is the basic thing do I have to do to get admitted to this school, ACT and GPA-wise, uh, or SAT or whatever. I mean, mostly it's ACT here in Utah, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't have to do TOEFL and everything else. 
that's the only invention because I do. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's all going to be dependent on the institution. Like there's, there's private institutions out there that cannot let you in without a certain ACT score. Like you could be a really good volleyball player, but if, you're not, if your grades and your ACT is high enough, we, like, you can't get into that school. Like you can't get admitted to that school. And there's schools that don't have those restrictions. And so that's going to have to be, that's just 100% dependent on the institution. That being said, just take care of school. <laughs> just do it. Practice taking tests. Yeah. <laughs> learn yeah. how to learn how to study more. To it. Yeah. Um, last question is going to go to Dan, and, and this is the final question, and then we'll just kind of have some closing thoughts. Um, brief closing thoughts, guys. Maybe we'll just let Dan. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go to this guy. Maybe you want to stay out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, since the dead period is now May thirty first, which you which you kind of already touched base, um, how is recruiting going to happen as far as offers and scholarships? So, yeah, that's a good question. That's a, that's a pretty good question. Um, we, as a general coaching population, are still trying to figure out the kids that, that oh, we're trying to offer for, let's see, the next class coming up that we can make offers to is 2022. Um, some schools, some schools may still be looking at 2021. Uh, but if that's the case, the school that or you're interested in, in or <laughs> to be honest, I, the email in between was um, something different for 27. Yeah. So, yeah. so oh, yeah, for sure. So it made those those coaches are still trying to trying to evaluate and rank who's my who's number one on my list, who's number two, uh, and with the dead period lasting so long now in us since uh, what, March. When was when was the second weekend of Crossroads? 15th, 14th, 15th, um, was, something like that. Or, it was the second week of, of March. Um, yeah. So it must have been 13, 14, 15, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And so with, since then, we haven't been able to go and evaluate players. So I think what's going to happen is once recruiting opens up, which I'm praying that it does, uh, coaches are going to find themselves in practice gyms. They're going to come here. Uh, they're going to go out because they're not going to be able to make it out to all these tournaments necessarily because it might conflict with something else they have going on. So it's going to be on our on our terms uh, to go into gyms to evaluate you to see how you're doing uh, and where you're at. So yeah. recruiting is really going to be sped up, and I don't think any coach is just going to uh, flippantly give out an offer if they don't feel right about it. So if you're expecting to get an offer August first uh, and you are a current sophomore about to hit your junior year, I would say maybe that's not going to happen because we haven't had enough time to evaluate. You during this club season. Because right. we've, you went to Vegas, I think I popped to Vegas for a day, and I went to Crossroads. Well, those are for even younger kids, not even 22s. But I've got a list of 2022 athletes that I don't know where they're at because I've seen them once, and I can't see any progress. So I'm not gonna be like, yeah, this kid's better than this kid. I've got maybe a general knowledge. So, so on that, um, let's say, because all uh, um, Colorado Crossroads is gonna happen, um, well, what they're saying it's going to happen and I want to say it's in June Lone Star is happening in June Red Rock Day is happening everything's in June. happening in June this, yeah. so, I gotta be more than one person in order for this to so a lot of things are happening in June are you guys gonna are you guys gonna be at qualifiers um, I mean yeah I mean that's the once once kind of everything settles down and, and we can get back on the recruiting trail like it's gonna be pretty chaotic for just as much as for you guys it is for us because like we've got to We've got it. Okay, all these what tournaments going on in two weeks. <laughs> we, how, what, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Um, and I've got beach to worry about as well. I guess the schools that you guys have a beach, you don't have to do. We get the double duty that, and so uh, it's going to be that's going to say both. I've got to, we've got to balance time for beach and indoor and, and everything else, and our whole staff. And so we're going to do our best to get to as many things as we possibly can. But if there's six tournaments that are on June second, because that's the first weekend available, we're not getting to six tournaments. <laughs> We All right. Fly. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, well, that's that's just it. I'm gonna go one day here, yeah. fly across country, do one day here, and go. And, yeah. All right. I'm gonna put you guys on the spot. Uh -oh. Okay. Pretend you're a cult or a club coach. Pretend. <laughs> I'll pretend. I'll What's that like? I was coaching club. Um, if 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 you were coaching in club, what is one thing that you would tell the club kids? What age? Um, let's uh, let's make it interesting, and let's say uh, let's say. 16? No, actually, let's go young. Let's go 14s, because you're not coaching 14s. Uh, you've, you haven't coached 14s in a long time. Long time. <laughs> but let's say a 14s kid, a 
kid who is just enamored right now okay. with going into the next deal, what would you say? That's that's find your why. Why why volume? Why why are you gonna commit so much time and so much effort to something potentially for a decade to come? Uh, because we've talked about this a bunch before, you're gonna have hard times, things aren't gonna go your way, and you're gonna want to revert back to why you started and why you do this. And I have this conversation with our girls and, and I've had this conversation with thousands of athletes across the country. Remember, like, always have like your grounding of what's going to get you through those tough times and never like, find it now because this is the greatest freaking sport in the world and like don't let one hardship take you away from the joy that this sport can give you. So find your why so you can enjoy this sport because whether that's two more years or whether that's a hundred more years Find a way to continue to find joy in the sport for the rest of your life, and then for as long as your career lasts, or just make your career out of it, like we were, we were, you know, fortunate enough to do. But find your why that you're going to invest so much to to keeping a stupid little rubber ball off the ground, <laughs> right? No, no. Dan, I, that was that was mine. <laughs> like that's that's really we had the I had a conversation with someone today about keeping kids motivated during. I said, well, why? Why do they need to be motivated? I said, well, I want to win, I want to win a national championship. I'm like, well, for me, that, that works. But for someone else, that might not work because that's not your goal, whatever it is, right? So if you can if you can always see what your end goal is and that that's your why, that's what you're fighting for, um, it makes all the grind in between so much easier. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it's worth it. And your why may change over the years. It, it, Great one. It's it's might not be the same thing that you were at 14 years old. 14, you want to be an Olympian. Yeah. At 16, you want to play the Division One college. Yeah. At yeah. 18, you want to play college. Yeah. So <laughs> your your why changes, and so that and that's okay. Um, and then I would also tell a 14 year old pass the ball. <laughs> I was a I was a girl, so I, I I played outside in high school, and I knew I wasn't going to be tall enough or jumpy yeah. enough to play, so I I started pass the ball yeah. so much. So. If you want to continue playing at the next level, if you can pass the ball, you can play defense, you will find your way onto your team. I like it. Okay, guys, I think with that, um, I just want to say thanks so much. I mean, like, like I said, we had to jump through a lot of hoops to make this happen. Um, thank you guys so much for uh, for taking the time to help to help our club. And uh, gosh, I have a lot of respect for you both, and so thank you so much for, for being here. So uh, from Hive, thank you. You guys are awesome. No problem. That was hey. awesome. Thanks for having us.